Grace and mercy and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We ask ourselves a lot of things as we go through our days if there's even a speck of introspection in us. Some people seem to go through life hardly ever asking themselves what's going on, what they're thinking, what they're doing. They just bounce around from thing to thing, from task to task, from surprise to surprise, and never think about their actions, the consequences, or anything else. But when we start looking at ourselves and thinking about who we are and whose we are, sometimes we come up with questions like our hymn just asked us, what is the world to me? In Ecclesiastes, Solomon challenged you to ask that question several times through the readings. Jesus likewise does it. Today's gospel comes right after last week's reading where the rich young man came seeking how he could inherit the kingdom of God through his works. And he went away sad because Jesus had told him that he had to sell everything and give to the poor and then follow him. And he had much wealth. Today, when Solomon challenges us to look at ourselves and our lives, he says, he who loves money will not be satisfied with money. And that's not just the super rich, although we see it more there. There are divisions in society. They talk about the 1%, things like that. There are those who pretty much just look out for themselves. And sometimes we get the idea that it's just an illusion that we're picking our leaders when actually we're just flipping from side to side in the same menu and someone else has printed the menu and decided ahead of time what's actually going to be served. But even the wealthiest finally find things that they cannot buy. Nobody has paid their way out of death. They may pay a little bit to avoid a lot of taxation. They may pay a little bit to avoid many fines. They may pay a little bit to avoid the consequences of their behavior in other ways. But finally, they can't take it with them. In fact, they can't always get everything they want in this life. Because the one who loves it greatly is the one then who wants to hold on to even more. The more you have, the more you want, the more you want, the more you have, the more you have, the more you want. That's the picture we're getting from one of the richest people who's ever recorded in the scriptures and the wisest one to his time at least. Solomon, son of David, was extremely rich, was extremely powerful, was extremely wealthy for his time. Yet we see from the scriptures that he often made foolish mistakes that he sinned against God, he sinned against his own people in one way or another. But when he was at his best and when he was looking around and seeing what was happening in the world, he gives us some things to check off. He who loves wealth with his income is not satisfied. When the goods increase, they increase who eat them. Not only the more you have, the more you want, but the more you have, the more you consume. The bigger and fatter and lazier you might get. And it's not just in matters of food, but when you stuff yourself with the things of this earth, you find yourself bloated and unable to think straight and to react clearly. What advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? Finally, you can have so much that you can't really do anything with it, but yet there's something that wants to hold on to grab on to more. He says, the one who works, the one who spends an honest day's labor for an honest wage, whether he has a lot or a little, whether he has a big dinner or just a little, goes to bed and can go to sleep. It's the ones who keep feeding themselves who lie awake. Not just because their stomachs are bothering them, but because their minds won't go to rest either. The more you have, the more you're worried about somebody taking it from you. The more you're worried about adding to what you already have, the more you're concerned about 
the opening of the markets, whether in New York or in the Far East, and how you can stack on a little bit more wealth to the piles you already have. There's a grievous evil I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept by the, and, or were lost in a bad venture. And he's the father of a son. You can pile things up, but if those things disappear, how do you take care of yourself and your family? How do you look out for the ones who you love and who may still, even after all your greed and grasping, might still love you? If it's all gone, it's all gone. It's not easy being rich. It's even more difficult being truly wealthy. And so the reading here today calls you to be satisfied with what you have. Be satisfied with who you are. Don't be the one who is grabbing onto things, sitting in darkness like a spider in the corner of a web in the basement of your house grabbing the fat, juicy bugs that go by, but never really getting out and enjoying anything remotely resembling a true life. Much vexation and sickness and anger. Even if it's not a physical sickness, there's a sickness of the soul that comes when you try to hold on to things. And you say, well, I'm not wealthy. I'm not even rich. Well, if you compare yourself to the richest in America, no, you're not. But if you compare your wealth to most of the rest of the world, now you're in the 1%. Now you're filthy, stinking rich. Now you can change things with what you have. And even we who have little can fall in the same temptation as those who have a lot and want just a little bit more. A little bit more padding, a little bit more cushion, a little bit nicer this, that, or the other thing. A car that's still functioning quite well needs to be traded in because it's just getting old and a little dinged up. A house that served us well for years needs complete remakes and renovations, not because it will help us to live our lives just because we want it to look better for ourselves and for the people who come in. Especially, it seems like, for the ones who come in. Perfectly good clothes can go out of fashion and we send them away and get more and when the ones that went out of fashion come back, we have to get new ones. It's hard for us just to live not only within our means, but within a calm and peaceful place in our lives. Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with, with which one toils under the sun the few days of his life that God has given him. For this is his lot. He says... I've seen the really rich, I've seen the really poor, I've seen those who work every day and those who goof off every day. And those who work, honestly and well, are the ones who are best off. They are the ones who can look at their life and say, things are going well. Maybe not perfectly, but well. I'm not starving, I'm not naked, I'm not homeless. I'm not a lot of things because the Lord has blessed me. But to do that, we have to finally say, I don't need any of that at all. If God takes it all away, what have I truly lost? Because as soon as we start thinking that this mine is mine, rather as we sing in the song, a trust, O Lord, from thee, we start upsetting the whole situation. We start thinking that those things are more important than that one thing that is truly needful. What is the world to me? With all its vaunted pleasure, 
when you and you alone, Lord Jesus, are my treasure. If you have Christ, you are truly rich. And he adds so many things onto you. But even if he takes all things away from you, you haven't lost anything if you haven't lost Christ. To be satisfied with who you are, with what you have, means that you have to be satisfied with whose you are. And realize that what you have finally is salvation. The forgiveness of sins in Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of greed and grasping and holding on to yourself, forgiveness of worshiping yourself, which really grabbing wealth is all about because who's most important in your life if you keep holding on to things? Who's that to benefit? God? No. Other people? Not really. It's to benefit you. It's your offering to yourself. When you realize that you belong to Christ and everything that you have then belongs to Christ, it's easier to release your grasp on it and not worry about feeding yourself because yourself is being fed. Not worried about taking care of yourself in every possible contingency of piling up one thing after another just in case. It doesn't mean that we foolishly throw everything away and trust the world to deliver food on our front porch. Because whether you call a local grocery or one of those online food deliveries, somebody wants some money or some labor or something for whatever shows up on your porch, in your kitchen, in your refrigerator, on your table. And we aren't supposed to tempt the Lord by throwing everything away and saying, I've done it, Lord, I dare you. But rather, as we trust in the Lord to honestly look at our lives, to see what we have, to see what we might need, and to see then what those around us don't have and what they do need. You might live until you're 100 years old. You might die today. You might see all the world markets crash. Or you might see the nations get richer and richer and richer. You might see many things, but the one thing that you will see is the end of your life on earth. And the only way to be satisfied with your life on earth is finally to be satisfied that your life on earth is not the end of your days. When your life on earth ends, your life in Christ continues. Your real life begins in your baptism and continues through death, through the grave, into the resurrection, and into an eternity with God. To be truly satisfied with what you have is to be truly satisfied that someone has you. That Christ's embrace of you, his love of you, is greater than any earthly love of money, of possessions, of power. If you want to know who the greediest being is any place, look to God. Because he absolutely wants to hold on to you. Not to hoard you and hide you away, but rather to display you, to use you, to invest you in the earthly kingdom. To send you out into the world with his love and with his gifts. Being a blessing to your family, to your friends, to those near and those far. To be satisfied that he is taking care of everything that you truly need so that you then can take care of those in need in your life. And Solomon says, Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept this lot and rejoice in his toil. This is the gift of God. For he will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. When a Christian gets up and in God eats and drinks and goes to work and goes to play and raises a family and says bye to the kids and welcomes the grandkids and whatever else there is in our lives, God gives us joy. We lose that joy when the things, the possessions, are more important than the people and the relationships. And we really lose that joy when we start focusing on grabbing those things for ourselves. Rather than living the lives that God has given us. 
of being content with our lot and lives and enjoying the fact that we have a purpose on this earth. The labors that we have, whether in the kingdom or in the physical, material world, are labors that God gives us. He possesses us so that our wealth does not. He invests in us so that we don't bank what we have and hide it away. He wants you to be satisfied with him so that you can be astonished at every other good and great thing that he gives you. To find joy, first of all, in being his child and then living and loving as his child. The simple things we know can bring great satisfaction, but the one thing that truly satisfied is to be Jesus' own child. To follow the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and to live as His and to love as His. Because everything else is vanity, it's emptiness, and it's trying to grab the wind. And why grab the wind when the Spirit has grabbed you? and washed you clean in baptism, and nourished you through God's word, and brought you into the church to receive the body and blood of your Savior. Every time you come into God's word, every time you come into his house, every time you come to the supper, you come to him to be fed, nourished, and built up, to get more and more from the one who's already given you everything. And he gladly and continually opens his hand to satisfy every desire you might have. I pray that your desires are the desires God wants you to have. And that what you grab onto is worthy, not just of this life, but also of life everlasting. That you can be satisfied, that you can be content, and that you can live in joy. In the name of Jesus, your Savior. Amen. The peace that surpasses understanding keep you in Christ Jesus. Amen.